Okay, uh, my name is Lars Brinkhoff, and I'm here to talk about some uh, early Emacs history. So I thought, what better way to present about Emacs than actually using Emacs? So uh, I'm about to log in here. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is my presentation, or actually, um, it's not going to be much of a presentation, rather a demo. Um, I uh, I was asked to show the very first existing version of uh, Tico Emacs from ITS, and uh, I thought I wanted to look, explain a little bit about the background and show some other programs as well. And um, so. So why am I talking about this? Um, I, uh, I have become increasingly interested in uh, computer history and spe especially the PDP-10 family of computers. So I, uh, I looked into uh, the MIT's ITS operating system, which is, of course, the uh, birthplace for Emacs. So first of all, um, as many of you will have heard, uh, Emacs comes from the Tico editor. Uh, Tico was created by uh, Dan Murphy at MIT uh, for the uh, research laboratory of electronics PDP-1 in 1962. Uh, it was a rather crude editor at first. Uh, it's good to understand that Tico is mostly a page-oriented editor. You would uh, come to the computer with a paper tape with a file and uh, probably a program printout on paper. And you would mount the uh, input tape in the tape reader and you would mount a blank tape in the paper punch. And then you would proceed to uh, Read in one page at a time, make your edits, punch out that page, go to the next page, and so on. Probably reading from your uh, program printout at the same time. So that's kind of the, the mode for editing using Tico in the first days. Uh, but uh, Tico uh, went over to MIT, sorry, MIT's AI lab, so their PDP-1. And the innovation over there was that they added the use of a CRT. So you can also see the page you were editing on the display. And uh, just a few years later, they also got a PDP-6 and ported over Tico to that. And they also used a CRT, CRT display for that version. And uh, that version actually has been preserved so we can run it today, and that's what I'm going to do for my first demo. Now I'm going to switch over to another screen. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, the uh, PDP six emulator and uh, let's forget about this black window for now so uh, i'm going to load the tico program and now we're running tico uh, we believe this program is from around 1967. so i'm just going to do some, do some light editing to show the flavor of tico here so first of all, let's insert some text. You use the I command, and then you just type. Uh, 
And there you have it, the first two lines in our file. So the first thing you'll notice is, where's my text? Uh, you kind of have to keep it in the head, your head most of the time, but if you type HT, um, you will display the text on the teletype. So uh, we'll pretend this window here is my teletype for now. H actually means a range of characters, with, which is the entire buffer, so the first page. And T means uh, print out on the teletype. So I type a double escape or double alt mode. And I get the first, uh, first few lines on my page here. Um, as you probably heard, uh, Tico is a programmable editor. So I'm just going to show a few basic elements of Tico programming. Uh, we have uh, queue registers, uh, which are kind of the variables for Tico. The problem means quantity register. So we'll insert, say, 65 in Q rest register A. And what can we do with it? We can get the value. Oops, sorry. I should have typed U A. And to use its value, we, use, we type Q A to fetch the value from Q register A. And what, 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 what do we do, do we want to do with that? We can insert it into the buffer and we can use I for that. So we should probably have uh, the ASCII character 65. Right, we got an A. And the second important part of uh, Chico programming are macros. Uh, the best way to enter a macro is to have it in the buffer. So we will clear the buffer. Is it empty? Yes. So a simple macro could be 65i. Just insert the ASCII character 65. Um, sorry, with, for, of course, we have to insert this text, 65i. Do we have it? Yes. So now we have that in our, our buffer. We can use that and put it in a queue register. So h again means the whole buffer, and x means put it in the queue register a. So if I execute this macro, I should get an A in, into the buffer. M, execute macro, and we use A. Did we get it? I think we did. That's kind of a little basic Tico macro programming. Uh, I also wanted to show a little short loop. So we're going to repeat three times. Let's use... Uh, B this time. And why not let's show the buffer on the teletype at once? Yes, we got three Bs. But the other nice thing that the AI lab added to the PDB6 Tico is uh, the use of a, of a CRT. So here's the CRT in our emulator. Uh, the text is probably a little bit small here, so we can make it bigger. Now it's bigger, or even bigger. Is that big enough? Um, and is there even a cursor? Let's go to the beginning, jump. Yes, there is a cursor. It's a small, narrow thing. So this is just to give a little demonstration of the first available Chico that I know of. So I'm going back. To this, which I hope you will see better. But let's, let's move on anyway.
<clears throat> so, um, by the way, I forgot to mention the previous uh, Tico version was running entirely without an operating system because that's how they use they use their PDP six in the first days. <clears throat> but they did want an operating system, so they created created the incompatible time sharing system ITS. And of course, they wanted the, wanted their old editor too, so they ported Tico to that. Uh, and from there, there was also, was a lot of development. Um, Carl Mickelson, he added uh, the control control R mode in 1972. This is uh, a quite important development because it's uh, added real time text display. Uh, it wasn't that very usable at first. It was slow and took a lot of processor time. So uh, Richard Stallman, he uh, found this control R mode and made it a lot better and usable. And he also added uh, the feature that pressing a key could run, run any Tico macro. So this uh, led to a lot of new Tico macro packages. Uh, for example, TechMac, Tmax, R mode, and uh, a few others. And also a lot of experimentation in this time. Uh, some of them even survived Emacs. For example, uh, R mode was used at Infocom, the text adventure company. So no, I'm, now I'm going to show a little bit of uh, um, ITS Tico. So here we have the actually the very latest version of ITS Tico. I, uh, I'm not going to do anything too advanced. I'm going to read in my little test file. So you, uh, you remember uh, to use Tico, you first get the first page in the file. You do that with the Y command. And here's the first page. Uh, you may see the little cursor in the top left corner. Let's move it a few characters. So you have a cursor showing you where you are. And if you want to uh, edit a save a file, you need to say use another another command ew. Let's say new file. So we should be able to write that later. So let's do a little edit. We move forward three characters. We uh, delete the number one and we insert one instead. Okay, we change the number one to the text one. So let's say we are finished with this page. Then we use, use the P command so we can move to the next page. And with the, when you're done with all your editing, you can use EE to punch out all the rest. Of course, there's no uh, paper tape here, that's just files, but Tico works the same internally anyway. So we should have a new file now called new file, sorry. And there we have the edited text. Uh, I also wanted to show a little bit uh, some of the uh, other Tico macro packages, for example, R mode. Uh, if you rem remember Tico, there wasn't much of a mode line, but here we have a mode line appearing. 
So that's something that was brought over to Emacs later. Um, the commands are uh, partly similar to Tico. So we use Control R E. Oops, sorry. Control E R R mode test. Hmm, sorry. So I managed to load another file into the R mode editor. And we can see here, uh, this is not page oriented anymore. We have page one and we have, we have the next page, uh, which is separated by a control L that is form feed character. So we have both, both pages displaying at once. And uh, I, added a few commands to this file beforehand. So we have, for example, moving down, control D, sorry, uh, moving next, okay. Control U moves up. Uh, but there's also a special feature in this R mode editor. Uh, it uses different modes for editing. Uh, so for example, we can use Control R word mode. And now we can navigate by words. So forward, next moves to the next word. P, Control P moves to the previous word. But we can also use the list mode, not lisp, list. L for lists, and now we will move by list, uh, move by list units instead. So uh, next moves over the entire list or into the list. Um, and I heard that this inspired the Emacs uh, programming language modes. So this is kind of a, an intermediate step between Tico and Emacs. So next page. Next, we move to uh, the early Emacs development. Uh, Guy Steele, he kind of uh, talked to all these various groups doing various Tico macros and uh, wanted to unify them. So in the summer of 1976, he started making a common command set for various TQL macros. And uh, at first, this project was just called question mark or question mark max for macros. But uh, as time went on, uh, there was an increasing uh, pressure to get a good name. So eventually, uh, I think Stallman suggested Emacs for editor macros. So, um, the files preserved from this period, uh, they don't have perfect coverage, but we do have a November 1976 version that we can run. So here we have it, the very first Emacs we can run, and it's just a blank page besides the whole line at the bottom. Uh, but it's very much a recognizable Emacs to us today. Uh, you can, of course, type texts. Um, control B moves back, F, Control F forward, Control N moves for the next line, and so on. But there are a few differences as well. For example, there is no escape prefix. Typing escape gives us a mini buffer. And of course, it's T this is Tico Emacs, so um, you type uh, Tico commands. There we get an A. 
uh, what else? Oh, we have uh, the help. Control C, question mark. So we already have a help system here. And by the way, uh, there, since there is no um, meta prefix, how do you uh, type meta x commands? Well, you don't really, you use Tico. So for, for, for example, mm list commands. This is the precursor to meta x commands. So here we uh, see a list of various commands. So uh, we do see that uh, we have uh, list mode, minus mode for assembly language, TECO mode, text mode, and so on. So we, it is a quite fully featured Emacs already at this stage. And by the way, we have R, R mail as well. Um, actually, R mail predates Emacs. It was written before Emacs. Uh, Maybe uh, you would have thought that uh, R mail was an addition after the Emacs was written, but actually it predates Emacs. Uh, so, I do have a question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Go on. So you've just listed the um, the functions which were available, but do you know if there were are they all written in C, or do we already have a concept of ELISP back then? Because I oh, think no, it's no. <laughs> a quite different time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the can, youngster asked assure... you a question. I, I knew that. <laughs> I can assure you there's, there's very little C in ITS or Emacs at this point. Uh, Tico is written in assembly language, and Emacs itself is written in Tico. Um, I'm, I think I can show you later a bit of uh, Emacs uh, Tico code. To get okay, thank you. I think you can find me for. Uh... A stronger understanding of the rest of the presentation, but thank you for humoring the youngster that yeah. I am. Yeah, no problem. I have one as well, if I could just butt in now, because you're, since you're talking about R mail, was that written in Tico or is that a separate external program? No, that's written in Tico as well, and it was a separate program at first, just like R mail and, and the other alternative uh, Tico text editors. But it was uh, folded into Tico Emacs uh, right, quite quickly. So actually, mm, you could use our mail from the command, sorry, command line, line like this as well. But it's more fun to run it from Emacs. OK, um, I think that's it for the early Emacs. So a little bit about uh, what happened next. Uh, everything, everyone thought Emacs was great. So um, everyone at MIT wanted to use it on their computer as well. I think the first Emacs clone was Aine. Emacs is not, sorry, Aine is not Emacs, written by uh, Daniel Weinreb in, already in 90, early 1977. Uh, next, I think, Tico Emacs was ported over to the top 20 operating system by Mike McMahon. And next year, uh, Ted Anderson at the Architecture Ma Machine Group wrote uh, Sign, which I think is uh, Sign is not Aine. And of course, the Maltics people wanted their Emacs as well. So uh, Bernard Greenberg wrote his version of Emacs in multi, uh, sorry, Mac Lisp running on Maltics. And not long after that, many other versions were written outside MIT as well. So uh, my last demos, which I forgot to update. will be uh, the very latest version of Tico Emacs for ITS. 
Um, I think uh, Emacs development ended quite uh, quite abruptly in 1981. Uh, I think the MIT hackers moved on to other things. So not, uh, not many updates were made after this date. Uh, but other Tico macro uh, packages were added for Emacs, even if the core wasn't updated. So I just wanted to show a few familiar uh, modes. Oh, sorry. Uh, we do, actually we don't need to uh, restart anything with and run. For example, dir ed the directory editor is there. So I, I have my file listing here. I can move the remove the file I created before. Oops, sorry. Uh, D to delete, Q to exit, confirm, yes. And like I said before, we, we have our mail to read mail. So we can read uh, all our inbox messages here. And we have the very much familiar info system that exists in GNU Emacs today. And you can even use the same files in both editors. So here we can learn about, for example, Emacs, of course. And uh, for my very last, last demo, I wanted to show a little bit of Lisp editing. So we start Lisp. This is MacLisp, by the way. And we can start L edit, L edit. So we have Emacs here, and we can uh, write some Lisp code. For example, a little greeting. We type uh, Control X Z. Oops, sorry, um, wasn't quite finished. First, meta Z, and then. Okay, edit completed. Do we have it? Yes. And we can edit it further. Um. And we have the updated function. So, um, that's all of my demos. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Lars. That was great. Um, anybody, anybody, feel free to ask questions, uh, unmute to ask questions or take, test, type your questions in the chat window. I, there's a question about what version uh, this right here is Emacs 162 from 1981. Uh, the first oldest Emacs we saw was version 24 from November 1967. Do you know how when they switched over to using like version 16 and version 18, like is there some way to correlate the more modern version? Uh, no, that's, that's a so, totally separate lineage. Uh, that's from GNU Emacs, uh, which started probably uh, in 1984 or so. And the installment started using the 1.1 version line. And it got to 1.12. And then it went over to 13. But that's a totally separate uh, version numbering. OK.
So uh, if there's no... I, sure. I have a quick question. I have a quick question. I'm uh, curious about your your normative thoughts about how this all ties in with where Emacs is at now and all the development that's occurred. I mean, in terms of uh, have there been great improvements? Is it deficient? I mean, just kind of a, an overall view, briefly, you know, with some uh, maybe an opinion about something. Is that possible? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, of course, Emacs has made great strides since then, <laughs> obviously. Uh, it's barely even the same technology today, but uh, still the very basics are pretty much the same. And if you're comfortable with Emacs today, you can pretty much go back to ITS and edit text as you would today. I think that's pretty amazing. Is there something we can learn from the way they did things back then? Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, I think Emacs stayed pretty much the same at its core. And uh, so uh, things have improved and I, I'm not sure uh, there's anything we can could take, take from the early versions and add in now. But I think Emacs pretty much evolved in the right way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very different time when Emacs was first invented, computers are really expensive and people were cheap relatively. And now computers are really cheap and people's time is really expensive. So the driving forces behind things like Tico and Emacs were different kind of different kind of economics. And and now, I mean, like Stallman wants to uh, add WYSIWYG to Emacs is what he wants to do, right? Like he wants to make it more of a word processor. Right. Right. And um I don't know if that's to reach a wider audience or just to make it um, to get away from a monospace fonts. I don't know. But yeah, the focus has shifted from conserving exp expensive machine cycles to conserving people's time. What does yeah. Emacs die out entirely compared to, you know, VS Code or some of these other editors? Or does Emacs have a long life ahead of it that's, uh, you know, exciting and feasible for new users? I think I more think. the latter. I think I think I th I don't know if any statistics back up a growth in Emacs, but there's certainly a lot of interest in it, and it's a very vibrant community. There's a lot of new packages being developed and updated all the time. It, it's it's so extensible. Yeah, it's pretty tough to beat, isn't it? <laughs> it? It's pretty much the. I mean, not that I'm a incredible. You know, I'm not an expert. Um, I've only been doing this, you know, eight eight years or something like that, but. Um, once it's really well, once you have your initialization file and you've worked through all the code, man, it is great. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, and and I mean there are interesting uh, experiments. I won't. I don't know if they're going to be commercially viable, but you know people are trying to rewrite Emacs, re rewrite the C portions of Emacs in Rust, and uh, Emacs itself. You know, now compiles down to native or has a JIT compiler. So there's there's certainly a lot of um, things that are modernizing it. Uh, I there's also been attempts to like replace Elisp with Guile scheme. So there's a lot of different experiments to take Emacs in new directions, but none of them have really seemed to have taken it. I mean, like the other experiments, like XEMX seems to have died out. That was a big fork, right? Well, I've noticed there's the System Crafters um, on YouTube now, who's a young guy who's kind of demonstrating how it all works for people. And just having looked at some chats here and there, one of the things I've noticed is that none of the young programmers are mentioning Emacs. Maybe that's just they're not in with the right crowd. But I mean, they're talking about any editor except for Emacs and Vim. So from that perspective, it looks like, you know, it's totally dead. It's not a thing. But then, you know, when you actually get to know Emacs, you realize that, you know, it's so much more than, than just an editor. But granted, it, it it is like customizing your own car or something. I mean, you really do need to put in a lot of effort to, to make it happen. And that's where I think that what that, you know, new YouTube videos and things that make it shiny, maybe that's what Stallman is thinking about, it are, you know, good additions just to keep it healthy so that you get occasionally people in the future that are still making amazing packages that the rest of us can use. Those of us that can't make packages <laughs> or, or don't have the time to. 
Yeah, well, it's also, I think it's getting easier for people to, to write packages. Uh, the uh, System Crafters videos, like I recently watched the one on one of the ones that they had on EXWM. So I actually bit the bullet and switched to EXWM and been playing with it. It's got a couple rough edges, but generally I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I'm curious let's... if uh, Rich Alderson had some input. Otherwise, I have a question about the old Tico Emacs. <clears throat> Go ahead. All right. Uh, Rich, uh, did I uh, interpret you correctly, if you wanted to say something? Uh, uh, Tico Emacs was uh, you know, really changing for a lot of uh, ADP-10 programmers. Uh, I first encountered it uh, in 1977 as version 155 on top C. Uh, and uh, actually, even my own version of, of Tico Emac, because the with top there's an extra line loaded in X. Uh, and uh, I just I moved all those functions into the the standard thing, which sped up uh, load time a little and uh, added a few things from uh, other Mac libraries like Teams and, uh, and such because they were handy for editing Tico. Uh, then uh, a good bit later in the uh, late 1990s, I published on uh, you know, the Usenet news groups uh, uh, comp.emacs and gnu.emacs.bug uh, 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 Y2 for the mode line package that gave you the uh, date and time, uh, which always assumed all digit year. And I published one that gave me four digit year uh, and started all and uh, Pitt, who had written the time packet, uh, at the point, declared me the uh, overall maintainer of Tico. If you uh, look for sources for, uh, for modern Emacs on uh, the web, you will find uh, version 11, which is the version that I created. Uh, otherwise, I'm a very happy uh, GNU Emacs user. I uh, have been using it since version 17 dot something. Very quickly to version 18. And have uh, gone along every month. I'm also still living as a PDP-10 programmer. So... I think I, could, worth. I, I think I could make out most of what you said, but you still are breaking up a little bit. Did everybody else hear, or does anybody have any questions about what Rich just said? I think I got the gist about it and a bit of envy to being paid for being a PDP-10 uh, programmer. Uh, I have a question maybe for, for Lars. Um, if you go back in time to Tico Emacs, I don't know if this is a relevant question, but can you say something about portability? Like, could I write my own Tico and get Emacs running on it? Or is it really tied to the PDP 10 architecture or something like that? I don't think it's tied to the PDP 10, uh, but it's certainly a lot of code you would have to implement. So it would be possible, but uh, very much a lot of work. Um, and uh, there are also a lot of different Tico versions out there, and they're not at all uh, entirely compatible with each other. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the question. Is the question about a modern version of Tico? More, more if the Emacs code base depends on a lot of uh, features specific to the Tico version running on the PDP-10 and ITS systems. 
There, there could be some 36-bit de dependencies in there, but overall, it's Tico is a somewhat higher level language than uh, than PDB 10 assembly language. So uh, I don't expect a lot of PDB 10 dependencies. So um, the message is: go ahead, do it. <laughs> I, I'll just throw this out here. I'll put, I'll, cut it, I'll paste a link into the chat that um, there is a modern version of Tico written in C that you can build and run on your own system. And so, all right, that would be an interesting exercise to get old Emacs to run on that i just wanted to thank okay. uh, lars for um you know making me feel caught you know, filling in some of the blanks in terms of the history as well uh it's really great pleasure to um, be able to connect with you guys yeah thanks it was fun to be here yeah and i'll uh, thank you so much yes thank you lars <laughs>